Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Um, McGraw Hill Education optimizes analytics workloads with Databricks. My name is Pratap Ramamurthy, Partner Solutions Architect for AWS. And I will be your host and moderator for today's presentation. When you joined today's webinar, you selected to join by either phone call or your computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your audio selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in the control panel. From this control panel, you will also have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions panel. <clears throat> we will collect the questions and address as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Also, at the end of today's event is a brief survey. Please stay connected until the end of the broadcast and submit your feedback as your opinions count. Lastly, the PowerPoint presentation will be available through SlideShare along with the recording of the webinar on YouTube via an email that will be sent two to three days after the conclusion of this event. So keep an eye out for the follow-up email sent to ad the address that you provided. All right, again, welcome to today's webinar, McGraw-Hill Education Optimizes Analytics Workloads with Databricks. My name is Pratap Ramamurthy. I'm a Partner Solutions Architect for Amazon Web Services. I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar. In addition to learning about uh, AWS, we will also hear from Brian Durkin, Senior Director of Partner Marketing at Databricks, and Matthew Ashbourne, Lead Software Engineer at McGraw-Hill Education. All right, today's agenda is, uh, we'll go over uh, AWS and AWS Data Lake services. Then we will uh, discuss, we'll, we'll hear about the Databricks solution that extends the data lake management capabilities. Uh, then we'll hear from McGraw Hill uh, Education, uh, uh, recognizing the need to transform and how they did it with AWS and Databricks. Finally, we'll have some time for Q&A. Today, you will learn how data lakes using a unified analytic platform can enable advanced analytic use cases such as machine learning, uh, how to optimize data lakes to work effectively with real-time and fast-moving data, how to streamline the read-write process for data lakes. And uh, remember, please post your questions in the chat box throughout this presentation as we will review the questions at the end of today's event. Let's begin. Um, the Data Lake solution uh, and AWS. All right. Uh, so in, in traditionally, um, enterprises save their data, store the data in large legacy data warehouses or in RDBMSs or relational databases. There are several problems that we have seen in these. That is, um, they are usually very complex to set up and uh, even more complex to manage. Um, they do not really scale in any way. That is, you have to pre-provision the amount of resources um, ahead of time. That means your planning has to be like hyper accurate. It could take months to add new data sources. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and <coughs> queries can take too long, um, especially if you have multiple users running very complex uh, queries. And you pay upfront for the uh, infrastructure uh, that you're going to use. Um, there is no a pay as you go model in these traditional data warehouses. Right? So, I'm sorry. Um, so, and, and these are, when we move from that to the new generation of data lakes, um, there's a, not just the infrastructure piece, there's also a different way of thinking of the way of collecting data, way of 
what kind of data should I really collect? Uh, previously in, um, in the legacy data warehouses, you have to really plan on like what is the kind of data that you're going to collect? How are you, what is the schema you're going to apply on this data? And what exactly are you going to store? Whereas in a data lake, uh, the concept is to not uh, decide ahead of time <clears throat> what is the schema, what kind of data you're going to store. Just store anything that you get. Um, uh, let's say if you're running a marketing campaign, you want to store as much as data as possible. Um, in your data lake, and hopefully one day somebody might find a, a treasure trove in the data that you collected. So throwing everything into um, uh, into the data lake and seeing if there's uh, somebody might be able to win the lottery uh, 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 from all the tickets that you bought. So that is that is the general uh, a change in the in the way in which you think about the collecting data, right? Um, so rethinking about how to become a data driven business, like. Think about business outcomes. Like uh, when I'm thinking about a data lake, now I first want to start thinking about like what is the business outcome or insights you're trying to derive uh, from this effort, right? And then uh, work backwards to a streamlined design. Um, another another important thing is to since we do not have an upfront fee, now you can now have run multiple uh, different experiments <coughs> on a on a smaller scale. And see which of these experiments really take off. And once you realize that uh, you've identified the successful experiments versus the ones that did not pan out, uh, you can kill the ones that did not run well, and then you can scale the experiments that really worked, right? And this flexibility is um, is uh, is very important uh, for being agile, right? Um, and and this this runs very well with the general theme of how things run on AWS. That is where you pay for what you use and you can deploy data processing infrastructure in within minutes and not like months. Um, and you can you also get to choose a wide variety of services um, that uh, that can cater to your needs. Right? That's that's like the main three things uh, that help you understand uh, thinking of like what is uh, how do I start? Right? So here's here's some more um, uh, diving a little deeper into like how you were thinking about building a data uh, data lake, right? So this is what you're looking at here is a typical pipeline where there's data, then you ingest it, you store it, process it, fine tune it, and so on, and then finally consume it in the form of a report or a dashboard, right? So but you do not start with this. You first start with a business case that is like what is the business outcome of this whole thing? Right. If you are running a marketing campaign, you probably want to see, hey, I want to measure the uh, the success uh, criteria of a marketing campaign, say. And then from that, you're going to start saying, hey, what is the kind of data um, that then you will look at, like, okay, what kind of data would I need to achieve that business goal? This could be, um, excuse me, this could be um, a Metrics and monitoring data it could be workflow logs, it could be ERP transactions, it could be point and point of sale transactions, um, it could be uh, uh, results from marketing campaign, survey results, and whatnot. Right? It could be from social media feeds, etc. Now, one now that you have that, um, now you can design your pipeline and make sure that the final outcome actually may, gives you the insights that you are looking for. And what are the kinds of uh, outcomes that you can get from such a pipeline, right? Like, like, what, like you, can, you can ask me, like, okay, fine, um, we have this data pipeline, we can do this, but how exactly is it going to help my um, business? So here are some ideas, right? The first thing is, um, over time, um, you might have had several different uh, legacy um, uh, of data warehouses and other technologies um, built over time, like over maybe even decades. So what you can first thing that this helps you do is to consolidate and modernize all of your data warehouses and data stores into one large data lake. The second thing is now that you have consolidated this, um, um, now you can think about um, new uh, revenues. Like maybe you can think about uh, personalization of your web application. Maybe you can think about demand forecasting. Maybe you can think about new ways of using this data. Um, to uh, increase your revenue, right? The third thing is um, you can think about 
uh, ways to engage with your customers in real time, right? This could either be um, uh, an interactive customer experience, maybe using a chatbot like Lex, or you can have a, a, a dynamic real-time fraud detection system that could alert your customers uh, that, hey, uh, uh, we identified a fraud in transaction, please check this. This happened, this really happened to me uh, last week, right? And the uh, last thing is, um, you, ha let you, you may have an uh, existing business, you may have uh, a process, you can use uh, automation to improve the, uh, uh, the effectiveness or efficiency of your existing business process. So these are like uh, examples of uh, things that can, you can do to improve your business using once you have this capability that of uh, data lakes. Okay, oops, excuse me. And when you talk data lakes on AWS, let's look at like what is a data lake on AWS? Um, AWS, the centerpiece in this, if you look at the diagram on the left side, it's not an architecture, it's more of a representative diagram of, of a data lake. You see S3 being the center part of this. Uh, and the, this is really important because uh, we believe that uh, S3 is, a, uh, is an um, object storage, um, a simple uh, a storage service on AWS that helps you store data. You have a key and you have a, a value pairs. And now, why is this the center? We believe in AWS that separating the storage from the compute um, is the key to scaling your data lake solution. And um, S3 is, going to, is an ideal uh, um, a storage for this, and we're gonna be discussing a few more. And again, on the top, you can see that you have all these uh, uh, other tools that are in AWS to help you query um, or analyze uh, the uh, the data that is on S3. For example, you could have um, um, a relational database like Redshift. You can use EMR, um, Elastic MapReduce, or you could use Athena, which can directly query uh, a SQL -like query on data on S3. Um, you could use Kinesis Streams to stream data. Um, uh, Elastic Search Service you, for to index and search through the data that you have uh, in your S3. Um, or you can use our AI, other AI services like uh, SageMaker to create uh, machine learning models and deploy those models. But to be able to um, to be able to feed this data into S3, we have several different services like um, Snowball uh, or Snowmobile. If you, if you if you are familiar with this, these are huge uh, devices which can hold 50 terabytes and upwards of data that can be shipped to AWS and this will be directly loaded into S3. Uh, or you can use other real-time upload services like Kinesis Video Streams, Kinesis Data Firehouse or Kinesis data streams. Um, and the, the most important thing is S3 is, is, uh, um, uh, is uh, very cheap. Um, you, can, you can store data uh, at like 2.3 cents a month, and you can query data at like 5 cents a month, 5 cents per GB uh, of data that is scanned. All right, so why is, why is S3? Why S3 for this modern data structure? It's highly durable. The first thing that comes to mind is highly durable. It has 11 nines of durability. It also has, is very highly available. Uh, it has 99.99% .99 of availability. High, high performance. Uh, you can do um, uh, uploads using multiple streams. And you can also do range gets. That is, if you have a large file that's one terabyte size, you can do a get uh, of, of a part of this file, like maybe just like 100 MB or 100 GB of this file separately so that you don't have to like download the whole file. <coughs> it's also easy to use. You can use our uh, RESTful APIs to access this. Um, it's scalable. Um, it's almost infinitely scalable. Um, and there's no minimum usage commitments. And, the, and another last but not the least, it's really well integrated with our other services, including um, EMR, Redshift, and all the services that I described earlier. That makes Rich, uh, S3 an ideal, uh, um, ideal um, storage for your data lake. But I want to hit upon this point of decoupling storage and compute. Um, what do we mean by that? When you have a traditional data warehouse, you're buying this huge piece of hardware, right? Um, and you're, you're, you're gonna have, you're gonna be, this is, this is gonna be the, the hard piece of hardware that stores your data, as well as the hardware that has this compute. Now, you cannot, let's say you have hit the limit on the uh, storage, 
but this compute is still not uh, 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 getting uh, utilized properly. Um, you have no other goal but to buy another piece of hardware. There's like, and that is going to come with your storage as well as compute. So you're going to these are this is always tied together at the hip, right? The storage and compute. And we want to decouple these two. When we decouple these two and we separate the storage from the compute, what you get is you can make these two scale completely separately, right? You could have at times you could have a large of campaign, and then you could have be getting large amounts of data that you're collecting right now at uh, this time, like let's say for the next two months. And maybe you're not going to be using or uh, running uh, any computational intensive um, uh, uh, processing on this data. That's fine. You can just store this data in S3, and you're just going to be paying for the storage costs. And on the days, on the time in which you're going to be actually processing it, you can provision a CPU resources instances to analyze this data and process this data. That really helps you scale the storage separately as well as the uh, compute separately. And that flexibility makes it a lot more effective. Okay, now I'm going to be um, uh, passing the ball to um, uh, Brian Durking, Senior Director of Partner Marketing at Databricks. Thanks, Pratap. Great job there. Um, you know, one right. of the things Take that I want to talk a little Can you hear me Take okay? It away, Brian. Oh, yeah, perfectly. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you. Uh, let me just scroll forward a little bit here. Can you move to the next slide for me? Perfect. Thank you. Um, you know, everybody wants to achieve the promise of AI and machine learning to transform their business. And, and the hardest part is bringing the data and the analytics platform together. And, you know, Pratap talked about separating out storage and compute. And, and I'm not trying to repudiate that because what I really mean about bringing data and uh, analytics together is more about uh, getting the data through like an ETL process and doing the steps that you need to do in order to feed it into your, your machine learning or AI system. And so that's what we'll talk about a little bit here when we talk about the unification. And then as we talk about data lakes here, what we'll really talk about is using S3 as for a top laid out and um, how do we optimize it in terms of the, the storage of the data and the access of the data. So, so we'll cover all that. Um, so as I said, the hardest part is you know bringing the data and the analytics platform together, and the DataBricks Unified Analytics Platform unifies data and AI. As you'll see in Matthew's talk, uh, this unification really enables you to transform your business. So a little bit first about DataBricks. You know we were founded by the original creators of Apache Spark. Uh, the team created DataBricks on AWS, providing the optimizations that enable DataBricks to run DataBricks to run faster than vanilla Apache Spark. Uh, benchmarking studies show it running, you know, up to 8x faster, but we have many customers who experience even higher performance improvements when moving from vanilla Apache Spark to Databricks. So when we talk about a unified analytics platform, there's three elements to this. There's collaborative workspaces, which remove the silos that, that teams work in. You know, typically a data scientist and the data engineers and, and business analysts, they usually have tools that they work in, and that ends up creating silos. And so Databricks provides a unified analytics platform where they can collaborate. Um, when you think about how analytics teams work, you know, iterating quickly and often asynchronously 24-7, uh, the ability to view the same workspace and see changes and make comments directly, directly uh, means teams can iterate faster, uh, you know, because one of the things that we always see is we start with a certain question and then... Um, you know, as we work through the question, all of a sudden we have new insights and then the question kind of shifts and we have a different question. And so it's that ability to really iterate quickly that, that accelerates innovations and is, and is really a key part of Databricks. Um, one other element of this, you know, we talked a little bit about the scalability up front there, but then one other element of this is the way that Databricks removes operational complexity. So the process of setting up Apache Spark and tuning it and spinning clusters up and down is all automated in Databricks. Um, and with our auto scaling capabilities, Databricks can spin up and down clusters uh, for the specific analytics jobs, lowering your TCO directly. Uh, but also, you know, it indirectly removes these manual processes. And since these processes often fall to data engineers and data scientists, this really frees them up to focus on their core value add, and that really accelerates innovation. So let me move forward one slide. There we go. Okay, great. That worked that time. 
So the elements of the Databricks Unified Analytics Platform include the collaborative workspace that we just discussed, where data engineers can create ETL processes to drive the perfect data set, and data scientists can create and train models, and business users can see the results and comment and provide feedback. These notebooks uh, provide multiple, uh, support multiple languages simultaneously. So if, you, um, if your data engineer is working in SQL or Scala, but your uh, data scientist is working in uh, Python or R, you know, that's just fine. So the Databricks runtime is the core engine that includes the optimized version of Apache Spark, and Databricks Delta is here too, which we'll focus on further as we explore the issues around streaming data. Oh, looks like I went too far, sorry. There we go. So streaming data presents challenges of its own, and, uh, and this is part of what we really wanted to address today. Um, you know, as streaming data comes in, um, you need a place to store it, and uh, you need a place to, to write it in a way that's optimized for retrieval. Um, and as you access that data, if you're working at large volumes, you know, new data is being written at the same time, and uh, as you are accessing it. So how do you ensure you get a clean data set for analysis? Um, furthermore, you know, as you're writing chunks of streaming data uh, to files, you can run into issues in terms of the number of files that you're trying to manage and uh, the ability to manage lots of small files. Um, and then, you know, you may need to, uh, to blend this data with historical data. So if you're looking at a click stream analysis, you may be comparing a website visitor's behaviors with past data or um, you know, if you're looking at something like uh, intrusion detection or credit card fraud, you might be comparing this to a large history of, of typical behavior that you have in a, uh, in a you know, written out database. And so the ability to bring together uh, the historical data and the streaming data, um, you know, is, is imperative for being able to do really good uh, analytics and be able to help you really solve the, the business case at hand. Oops, one more, there we go. <laughs> um, so based upon customer demand, Databricks created Delta, and Delta addresses issues around streaming data, uh, how to optimize the right, uh, how to access the data set cleanly, and the result is 100 times faster than Apache Spark accessing Parquet. So we leverage Amazon S3 for massive scale. Um, we use open file formats for portability, and as you'll see, you know, our customers have huge amounts of data and this can really transform their business. Um, Databricks' ability to provide a, a unified analytics platform enables your organization to accelerate innovation by bringing your teams together, uh, reducing infrastructure overhead, and providing the highest performance analytics engine available. And so to talk more about the impact that's having, I'd like to turn it over to Matthew Ashbourne. Thanks, Brian. Uh, my name is Matt Ashbourne. Let's get the slide control. Could you pass slide control to me? Oh, perfect. Yeah, as I said, I, my name is Matt Ashbourne. I'm a lead software engineer uh, at McGraw-Hill Education, um, and I lead up our streaming data and analytics platform. And so first, a brief history of McGraw-Hill Education. We're best known as an educational publisher, but over the past few years, we've been heavily investing uh, in our online learning platforms. Uh, and and from, from all these online learning platforms, we capture a lot of student interaction data. And, and we use it in both kind of traditional reporting um, for teachers to know what's going on in their online courses, uh, as well as new next generation products, leveraging machine learning. Uh, and, and the goal here uh, is to optimize the learning experience for students and teachers and ultimately uh, drive student success. So first, I'd like to start off with a success, source, success story using Databricks. Um, and it was kind of the first partnership at McGraw-Hill between our data science teams and the data engineering teams uh, coming together in this great collaborative Databricks uh, workspace to build something. So what we're uh, looking at here 
is uh, a prototype uh, reporting application. This is just hosted in what we call the Learning Science Dashboard. It's a portal uh, we put together to kind of expose um, prototypes and learning science research to pilot customers as we're iterating on, on the data on the machine learning models. And what, what this uh, one specifically was analyzing was uh, student attrition risk. So how likely is a, is a student to drop or withdraw from a course? Um, the prediction is powered behind the scenes uh, by a linear regression model running on Databricks. So consuming uh, all the various data points we collect about student behavior, putting that through uh, a model. And what our data scientists were able to do is be able to come up with an accurate prediction of the risk of dropping the course within the first three weeks, um, which is really important when you're looking at wanting to do um, intervention uh, to keep that student in the course, keep them learning, keep them on track for graduation. And then here we can see just another view of the same data set, um, but this is a more advanced one that our data scientists put together and share with select pilot instructors, usually quant professors that really love to see the underlying data. This is a, hey, this is Prasad. This is a very interesting graph there. Um, how, how did you generate this graph? Oh, good question. So basically from within Databricks, uh, the data scientists are able to do lots of exploratory analysis inside of the notebook environment. Um, in their case, uh, as Brian mentioned, supports many languages. Um, they like using Python, and there's some great visualization libraries in Python that output HTML. Uh, and so from within Databricks, they essentially generate uh, this visualization. They can see it in their notebook, uh, but then we export it um, just to S3 where this research uh, portal picks it up. Oh, cool, thanks. Great, so now I'm gonna move on to cover some of the challenges. Um, so McGraw-Hill had some existing legacy ETL pipelines. Um, so we kind of already had our, our business use cases. We knew what our data has to look like, where it comes from, but we had some key challenges in three categories of data access, processing, and scale. And so I'll dive into them a bit here. So under data access, um, you can see we have various uh, transactional systems, um, some with read replicas, so that's there on, on the left. Uh, and and the, the big challenge there is the schema binding to transactional systems. So your, your extract portion of your ETL pipeline has a direct schema binding to that uh, database, which makes it really hard on the application teams who want to move agilely uh, perhaps need to change their schema uh, to support new features, and that has a cascade effect on analytics, uh, which can be problematic. Another piece, of course, is uh, just the cost of read replicas. Uh, McGraw-Hill has a lot of um, various learning systems that we've accumulated or acquired, and ha having read replicas for all of them uh, can start becoming quite expensive. Uh, the third area of challenge is under processing. Um, and so starting off before Databricks, we kind of had this splintered tech stack um, where you see we had some ETL pipelines running in a third party uh, data integration platform. Um, we had the data scientists um, doing analysis in Spark, um, but they were actually on a bare metal cluster in the data center. So they didn't have any elastic scaling, uh, didn't have good ops support, they were SSHing in, it was hard to get access to data to be able to process it. Um, and they were also using uh, like pandas on their, on their local machines, on their laptops, kind of playing around with stale data sets. Um, and then finally, we see at the bottom, uh, we do have some data pipelines that we're using um, fully managed Amazon services. Uh, and I can give those, those a thumbs up. They're 
processing wise, scalability, they're great. You can see um, Kinesis, AWS Lambda, Amazon Elasticsearch, and S3. Uh, and then finally, though, um, when we're talking challenges, is, is one of scale. And so in, in the legacy system, uh, we had this third party integration platform that I mentioned. Uh, it wasn't uh, fully elastic. Um, so it, it meant engaging the DevOps team to help scale it up to do performance tuning, JVM tuning, issues like that. Uh, we also were doing quite a lot of uh, the transform and load of our pipelines within uh, Postgres RDS instances and started hitting um, the issues there where your storage and computer coupled and we're hitting uh, some, some bottlenecks. And so just to uh, kind of summarize, all of this led to issues um, being able to productionize the output of data scientists because they were just kind of off on their own um, doing some Spark stuff in the data center, doing some pandas on their laptops. We had schema binding to transactional databases, which was impacting the ability for the whole organization to change quickly. Data engineering was kind of split across these various tech stacks, and we had some scaling issues. Uh, one more thing I didn't mention from the previous slide, um, this legacy system that was actually capturing data uh, in S3 as a historical um, store uh, was suffering from uh, the small file issue, small file challenges, and I'll touch on that uh, a bit more in the next slides. And, and finally, there's just a high overhead um, of adding new data sources, because there's a lot of kind of point to point, opening up access for whatever JDBC connection, open up to some read replica, oh, we have to drill a hole and get network routing into some data center somewhere. And so that kind of brought us along to thinking of what are alternate uh, solutions? And obviously, uh, one of the most popular ways to start tackling uh, your data uh, is, is the data lake. So I'd like to just quickly uh, dive in a bit more about what, what is a data lake. So I have this nice uh, diagram, uh, which I hope will help anyone who isn't super familiar. Um, so of course, here on the left, we have our, our lake. Um, but flowing into it, we have these streams of data. So to extend the me metaphor, we have streams or rivers of data flowing into the lake. And that's data that's mostly in a raw form. Uh, it gets into the data lake where our data scientists and data engineers can do exploratory analysis on it, um, usually using some type of big data tool like Apache Spark, Hadoop, Flink, et cetera. Um, and the data lake itself is usually implemented as files in some, on top of some kind of massive storage layer like HDFS or, of course, Amazon S3. And then continuing on, uh, when you do have, OK, you know your business case, there's value in this data, we want to process it, you then select and transform data out of the data lake uh, for each of those needs. And then th now you're getting into kind of a bit more of the transformation pipelines. Um, and you clean up the data uh, and then maybe load it into what I like to call are these lakeshore data marts. Oh, Matthew, can I can I interrupt you there for a second? Sure. So I, I love your terminology, especially the term of uh, lakeshore data marts. I have like an intuitive idea of what that is. Like, can you like explain what do you mean by lakeshore data marts? Sure. Yeah. So it, it's bringing the whole metaphor together. If, if the lake, if your data lake is kind of the central technology to your data strategy um, on on the shore of a lake you know you can have cottages or you can have your lakeshore data mark where you uh, keep all your goodies like your your jet skis uh, etc perhaps um, but but ma mainly this is going to be a much more structured uh, view of your data that's useful for that business use case so think you're materialized um, views of the data that can power 
um, some reporting query, some API that uh, returns insights that's then integrated right into uh, a transactional application. Uh, and so one kind of benefit of this whole setup is it makes it really easy to, to prototype um, your ETL pipelines because you kind of have you have your data flowing in from other systems. You can start looking at it, you know, before you do your sprint planning, et cetera, and have a lot better uh, idea of what's going on. And so just to touch on some specific requirements we had, um, uh, one was we wanted to investigate this as, as a potential solution with a small team. So we're looking for something that didn't need a massive engineering effort to get going. Uh, just due to some of our existing real-time data feeds, we want to support for concurrent writers. Um, so into the data lake, we want to be able to have multiple different writers uh, loading data. Uh, and we wanted something that's resilient and auto-healing um, so a small team can easily manage it. And then fi finally, we wanted something that can automatically compact small files to improve read performance. So streaming data comes in kind of at a high velocity. Um, and if you just naively write it to S3 or anywhere, you're gonna end up with a lot of small files because your data is amortized over the 24 hours of the day. Um, really, you want your data in some slightly larger files. So when you then go to query it to use it, um, you're not paying a huge overhead listing files, finding what to read. Um, and so that leads us to some of the issues when we just started looking at the open source op options. Um, so out of the box, you can spin up a Spark cluster, but you still need to know uh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff to get what you desire. Um, so you can run some ETL pipeline and then just accidentally end up with either sm too small or too large of output files. Uh, your jobs can fail. You can get, and then have you, you have a dirty output directory that then maybe a second uh, phase of your pipeline is supposed to pick up and now it's reading um, dirty files and complete output. Um, also, there isn't a whole lot of support for schema management. Um, there's no transactional support or safety like you would have uh, in your traditional relational database that a lot of developers are used to. Um, and there's no real safe way to have multiple writers because really you're just interacting uh, with files or objects in S3 and you don't have um, kind of transactional concurrency guarantees. And that, that's where uh, Databricks Delta comes to the rescue. So Brian touched on this. I'll run through uh, a bit deeper. So Delta gives you ACID transactions just like um, your traditional database, uh, except over Parquet files on Amazon S3 or on Azure Blob Storage. It also gives you delete updates, upserts. So your traditional kind of SQL ETL workflows um, work cleanly on Databricks Delta and they can modify the data set without interfering um, with any jobs that are reading the, that data. It gives you some data validation, some schema validation. Uh, and most importantly, if you remember, I've touched on small file problem. It gives you automatic file management. Uh, so there's a great optimized command that you can just run on your data lake and it automatically compacts all those small files um, so you can get performant reads. And then finally, they also compute some extra statistics um, that further improve uh, read performance. And so now we kind of have this more simplified uh, architecture uh, where under data access our entire organization has, has moved to more of a streaming model uh, where source applications uh, push events in, into Kafka brokers and then analytics consumes from the Kafka brokers. 
Uh, our processing has been standardized on uh, the Spark API and, and Scala running in Databricks. So it's all cloud instances, it's spot instances, and it's auto scaling. So we get a lot of cost savings and not uh, much overhead managing uh, very large clusters that also elastically scale and do exactly what um, we need them to be doing in multi-stage pipelines. The cluster can automatically bring on more capacity for the second phase and it'll automatically shrink down if the further phases don't need that many CPU cores, for example. And then finally, when we're talking about scale, uh, you see we still have RDS there. So that's our data mart. That's where we're loading um, our super cleaned data ready for reporting. Um, but now uh, the majority of our IO, our processing, we're, we're trying to do uh, within Spark um, and anywhere we have to persist um, intermediary data, we're trying to move that into Databricks Delta uh, where we have very horizontally scalable IO uh, with these Parquet files on, on S3. And so just to quickly run down, we had quite a few uh, challenges and Databricks a unified platform has really helped us on every single one of them. And so now I'll, I'll dive in a bit on the actual implementation uh, details. So number one, you still need some information architecture. Uh, you want to avoid what you call the data swamp um, by having some consistent na names, identifiers, uh, for all your entities, services, where the data is coming from. Um, that's super important. You need some schemas. You need to know what data is in your data lake to get value out of it. Um, you likely want a fairly flexible schema for your data lake, because once again, uh, you're talking about fairly raw data. So at McGraw-Hill, the approach we took, we actually keep the uh, raw message as a JSON string. So this is a parquet schema, actually. So each, each one of these columns are kind of partitioned in their own. And then we have kind of what type of event is it? Uh, a header with some traceability routing uh, and metadata. Uh, whoops. Sorry. Uh, the body, and that's the actual event payload. Um, some information about the schema of the event. Uh, versions, and then we actually physically partitioned our data lake uh, on the source of the data, uh, event name or the, or the type of the data, and then event date, event date, which is when it happened. And this physical partitioning uh, allows you to drill in um, and have your queries when you're querying this from Spark, um, push those predicates down and reduce I/O you're doing on S3. So if you only wanted to look at data from one source, for today, you can launch that query and it's only gonna read the files it needs to. And you get quite performant um, queries despite only paying for storage on S3 and, and some spot instances. And here you can see um, how you read and write uh, batch data frames in Spark to Delta. Um, and so as Brian said, they layered this on top of the open source Spark and so just instead of Parquet, you say Delta, um, and, and it works exactly the same. Uh, similarly, with streaming read and writes, uh, you can use a Delta table as a, as a streaming source. So any changes um, that are coming into your data lake, you can actually consume that as, as a change and implement kind of change data capture patterns, et cetera. Uh, and similarly, uh, you can write a stream of data uh, into a Delta table. And this is exactly how I implemented uh, the data lake. So where I have uh, the Spark jobs consuming those Kinesis streams uh, and those Kafka partitions, uh, it's writing those streams right into the, into the data lake. 
Another concept uh, that's pretty important when you're talking about data lakes um, it is kind of deferring work until it uh, produces value. Um, so there's, there's this concept of schema on read. So as you saw uh, when I was sharing the, the parquet schema of the data lake, we had some columns there that are essentially were just JSON strings. Uh, once we actually know what we want to do with the data, we can supply the schema to Spark and do that JSON parsing at uh, massive scale. Uh, your IOs from S3 are nice horizontally uh, partitioned and your JSON parsing as well. And then you end up with a data frame with just the data you're looking for, as opposed to trying to do all that parsing and breaking out data into columns um, before you do the write which can be much more computationally expensive and difficult to keep up with high velocity data. Oops, so trying to advance slide here. Could you advance the slide? Thanks. And you can also do um, the exact same thing through views. Uh, I just wanted to share this. So this is a view over a, a Delta table. So it could be over your data lake, et cetera. Um, and you see when you query this view, it's actually doing some JSON parsing right there, um, similarly as we were doing before with the Spark API. And so to bring it all together, um, I have a quick case study. We had a existing ETL pipeline um, that was running in, in Spark, but had this intermediary um, staging step where data was written to Postgres RDS and then read right back out for the next phase. Um, and what we did is we broke it down um, and kind of used some of these new patterns I've been talking about. So my team had the existing uh, Spark Structured Streaming and Delta Data Lake already built. Um, the source team, uh, in this case was rostering, so a student being added to a course. They started, whoops, we have some Windows start menu issues, sorry about that. Uh, they started publishing messages uh, to Kafka and they just automatically got discovered and started being uh, written to the data lake. Uh, when the data engineers were ready to take on this new uh, refactoring work, they already had example data, data sitting there in the data lake in both non-prod and production. Um, and they were kind of able to prototype uh, a new pipeline that, that reads out of uh, Databricks Delta, does all the transformations in memory, and then directly loads the data mart um, pretty quickly. And it worked out really well. And so the, the real deal is there's quite a lot of transactional systems all publishing now into what we call the data backbone. Behind the scenes, it's Kafka or Kinesis, uh, which then we use Spark Structured Streaming to stream into a data lake, which is uh, using Databricks Delta, uh, which is really just optimized Parquet files on S3. Uh, and then we have further Spark ETL jobs that read from the data lake and into a data mart where then we have kind of API serving layers, uh, getting those insights out to students and instructors. Uh, just want to wrap up with some possible pitfalls. Um, you definitely need a strategy up front. Um, I've been kind of talking a mile a minute to try and share as much as uh, I could about this, but you can see there's a lot of complexity and likely new ideas um, if your team hasn't built systems like this before. Uh, there's some organizational change required when you're talking about moving to uh, eventing. And you're going to need, uh, obviously, training on this uh, new technology. Um, some surprises. Uh, the actual data pipeline development isn't faster but we have a lot more options uh, and flexibility. The ETLs themselves, the runtimes um, have gotten shorter. 
uh, and we have a lot more options to scale it. Uh, and with Delta, we're able to easily combine um, streaming and batch data, which was difficult before. And really the takeaway is having a unified platform uh, where you can deal with all of this and incorporate data science uh, work uh, is really important. Oops, let me get the next slide. There we go, okay. I think we have some time for Q&A. Oh, thank you, Matthew, that was wonderful. Um, I have a, a few questions from uh, the audience. Um, uh, first question um, I have for Databricks. Um, okay, is, is Delta a new offering? And a follow-up question on that. Um, is Delta uh, generally available today? Yeah, great question. So Delta is a new offering. It's in preview at the moment, and you can get more information at the databricks.com website. Uh, you can also find out uh, some more about some of our various uh, integrations with AWS uh, if you go to databricks.com slash AWS. Oh, cool. Thanks. Um, all right, so another question. Um, is, is there a GitHub repo from which you can get the code samples? Um, the slides will be shared and the recording will be in YouTube. Um, we did not have uh, uh, any code samples uh, very much here, so um, so that that is uh, um, not applicable here. Um, all right, question for Matthew. Um, how long did it take for you to transform from your old architecture to the new AWS Databricks architecture? Uh, good question. So we're, the the short answer is we're not done yet. Um, it, it is a lot of work and uh, we're tackling it incrementally. Uh, so we've had a lot of the foundational pieces um, like the data backbone, Kinesis Streams, uh, the data lake um, up and running in production um, for quite a few months now. And the huge push of teams to instrument events has also been happening in parallel to that. And we're nearing kind of a hundred percent of systems um, sending events, but it, it's definitely something um, that you tackle incrementally. Um, and once you have the foundational pieces to somehow stream data and get it into the data lake, bringing new systems online um, and following these patterns is, is, is fairly simple. Okay, thanks for that. Um, all right, another question for um, Brian from um, Databricks. Um, mm -hmm. Does Databricks use the latest version of Spark? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, because we contribute over 70% of the uh, work on Spark, um, we are always up to date on the latest version and actually when you go and, uh, and run Databricks on, um, on AWS, you can choose different versions of Spark. So you can actually go backwards to previous versions, um, but we always have uh, the latest version um, up and available since you know we're, we're so involved in, in getting that uh, up and running and, and uh, the whole contribution process. So great question. Yeah, and not, not just the most recent version. Uh, Databricks makes beta, beta releases available um, so obviously we had that question about Delta. Um, McGraw-Hill has actually been using um, Delta in production since it was al alpha release um, and private preview. Um, and it's it's been very stable. And so it's, it's been great kind of partnering with Databricks so they get you access to the goodies um, quickly, but without the headache of being on the bleeding edge. Yeah, and uh, I should also point out, as I mentioned, that Delta is in preview. If you go to databricks.com slash Delta, uh, you can get right to the page where you can sign up and take a look and learn more. Cool. Awesome. Um, a follow-up question for uh, Matthew um, from on the, to the previous question. Like, what was the cost differential between the previous architecture and the new one? So cost-wise... Yeah, so cost-wise, um, you can achieve some savings 
Um, but really a lot of the value um, is enabling a more agile approach um, to your data practice. So like I, I touched on how you had that schema binding, like sure you're paying for read replicas, but um, having that schema binding just slows down your whole organization, not just analytics, or you have your transactional teams moving fast and then breaking analytics, which isn't great either. Um, but for a direct um, cost comparison, I can talk a, a, a little bit and just throw out some numbers. So basically in our, our non-prod environments, um, the we have two data marts, um, and so they're post, Postgres RDS, um, and I think they probably both have 300 gigs of disk. So the, the, the billing for those is equal to um, my Spark clusters and um, S3 billing, but the difference is those data marts um, only have like what, 48 cores between the two of them and 600 gigabytes of storage. Um, on, on S3, I have like eight terabytes of data and I can spin up a cluster with hundreds of cores uh, within minutes and fully bootstrap with Spark, run queries and then, and then shut it down. Um, Hope that helps. Yeah, um, I think so. Um, all right, so another question for Matthew. Um, how do you handle duplicate data? And how do you maintain data integrity? Also talk about like uh, compression of uh, the files and storage to reduce costs. Sure, a lot of, a lot of stuff uh, packed in there. Um, so first, yes. the, the- I combine the two questions into one. Yeah, so for, for file compression, um, Databricks kind of has that somewhat tuned out of the box. So Delta is on top of, of Parquet, which itself is kind of a highly optimized file format. Um, and I believe we're running snappy compression. Um, we haven't uh, had to tune that a whole lot. Um, basically, the, the default settings we've been getting from Databricks have, have got us up and running and seeing very satisfactory performance out of the box. Um, as far as duplicate data and stuff like that, um, we handle it in two ways. Um, so it, in some workflows, we still depend on uh, a relational database that has constraints um, when you're loading the final uh, kind of materialized view and doing uh, a two phase. Uh, first phase, do all your inserts of new data and second phase, do, do updates. Um, the, the other approach, which is the massively scalable one, is just using Spark to dedupe records. Um, so definitely in, in the data lake, uh, using streaming data technologies, you don't, you don't really have an exactly once and only once guarantee. Uh, you might have the same event more than once. Um, and that's where having proper uh, identifier schemes is important. So all, all of our events that are sent um, are minted uh, with a GUID on them. And so in, in Spark, it's really easy. Um, they actually even have a little helper on a data frame that you can just say drop duplicates and you pass in uh, that GUID or unique identifier column name and it will just drop all um, the duplicate data. Okay, cool. Um, so thank you. So we have a few more questions, but we have run out of time. Um, so uh, I thank you, Matthew and Brian. Um, uh, thank you all for attending today's webinar. Please uh, remember to stay connected and complete the brief survey at, at the conclusion of this webinar. We look forward to supporting you in current and future projects. Thank you again, and have a great day.